This is a very big day for us at uh, Balls.ie because it's our first ever proper event and no better place to do it than the wonderful surrounds of the Science Gallery. If you haven't taken the opportunity to check out the Life Blogging Exhibition, then get your shit together because you've only got another uh, 10 days to do so. It's closing on the 16th. And really it's this kind of fascinating insight into the mass accumulation of data that we all uh, seem to be accumulating at the moment in our everyday life. Um, and when we had the opportunity to think about that in terms of sport and the opportunity to host an event here, we were absolutely thrilled to step up and do so. So hello to everybody watching on balls.ie. I'm sure you're all already following the Science Gallery on Twitter and hopefully uh, the website too. But if anybody has any questions for us tonight, there's two ways of asking. You guys at home can get us on the hashtag scienceballs and everybody in the room it's the science gallery, so we don't have a normal roving mic. We have a mic block. Is that the right word? Catch box. Catch box. So basically, we're going to throw it at you, and uh, you're going to use all your sporting prowess to catch it and not break anything. And as soon as you touch it and catch it, the mic comes live. Um, so what we do want is for this to be fairly interactive. So if there's anything at any point that you want to ask a question on, as opposed to waiting for the end and getting all the questions in, then stick your hand up and uh, we'll throw the catch box at you, or hand it to you gently, I promise, in case you're a little bit worried, he's shaking his head. We'll, we'll definitely do some gentle handling. Um, uh, yeah, so please do ask questions in the middle, and also for the best questions, we have some brilliant uh, memorabilia and merchandise from uh, Football Manager for you. So, to our guests tonight, for the inaugural Balls.ie Science Gallery Sports Talk, I'm delighted to welcome Simon Cooper and Professor Tom Markham. Simon Cooper has been in the vanguard of the revolution in quality sports writing in Europe over the last two decades. Football Against the Enemy was and remains a seminal work in the sports canon. His later work includes an absolutely amazing book about the history of Ajax Football Club during the Second World War. And his most recent work, Soccernomics, is a constantly evolving story and has spawned a thousand imitators. Well, I'm sure you're all familiar with his work in the FT, which is consistently the best in class, and we're absolutely delighted he's made the journey from Paris tonight to be with us. Tom Markham has a very famous name. Those of you who know your sports trivia will know that it's the name of the All-Ireland Minor Football Championship Trophy, which I believe is a family connection. Yeah, so not only that, uh, he is also the Head of Strategic Business Development at uh, SI Games, who of course make the wonderful football manager, which I'm sure so many of you are familiar with. Um, so a big round of applause for our two guests this evening. Thanks for coming, lads. <clears throat> when did you get interested in the use of statistics and data in football, Simon? Uh, this sounds very nerdy, but actually not that long ago. It's only in the last... 10 or 15 years, I think, that it started to become a big thing in, in football. And when we wrote a first edition of Soconomics, which came out in 2009, we didn't actually have a chapter about using data on the field. And we've rectified that in later editions because it was just then becoming a thing. What was the start of it? Who discovered that this is important and we should be collecting this information and we need to learn what to do with it? Well, people have been trying to use data to judge players and work out how to play for a long time. So when I wrote my first book, I was in Kiev soon after the Berlin Wall came down in 1992, so it really was a different world. And the club Dynamo Kiev had this chief scientist, a guy called Zelensov, Dr. Zelensov, and you know, in those days, no football club had a chief scientist. So Zelensov, he had me play these computer games that they used to select the team. And it was kind of Space Invaders style games, and like you had to move this figure around a moving maze, or you had to shoot these Space Invader type things. And um, you know, I played these games, and I w he told me I wouldn't have been picked for Dynamo Kiev. But I said, <laughs> you can't use computer games to pick your team. I mean, what if Zavarov and Belen uh, Belenov, the two best players, of Kiev. I said, what if they did badly in these games? You'd have to pick them, yet they're your best players. And Zelensov said to me, Zavarov and Belenov always had the best results in these computer games, even when they were injured, even when they were out of form. And he said, we picked the Soviet team for the 1988 European Championship exclusively using these computer games. <laughs> so, and us and Wenger around that time in the late 80s was already also doing that kind of thing. So there is a long history of this, but it only became at all mainstream, I think, the last 10 years or so. Tom, we were talking a little bit earlier on and uh, you were talking about how your parents laughed when you told them you ended up getting a job with football manager given all the, 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 the wasted youth that it turns out wasn't very wasted at all. Talk to us a little bit about how the game 
is now actually a useful tool for real life football clubs. Because I think this is a, one of those mind blowing things where, hang on a second, the computer game is being used by the actual clubs to scout players. But isn't that the complete reverse of how it should be? Yeah, well, it, obviously it's, it's sort of art imitating life. It's, it's gone full circle. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, we have a, a scouting network that's been built up over, I think, 22 years at this stage, but it now uh, includes 1,400 scouts worldwide in 52 different countries that are analysing all of these leagues. So, from a um, well, from a from a scouting perspective, uh, Prozone approached us, and Prozone, for the people, I'm sure a lot of people in the room are familiar. Uh, are one of the main analysis tools used by professional clubs around Europe. But they were developing a system called Prozone Recruiter, and that was to enable clubs to whittle down their scouting, uh, the players that they wanted to scout. So we were able to provide all of the attributes. So hypothetically, if you wanted a, a centre-back to play, if you've got a French-speaking centre-back that's a, a small ball player, you want a tall one, we can whittle down that using the system, and obviously you can pick, pick a centre back accordingly. So it, it, what happened was that you had all this data and information about real life players playing in the top divisions and the second divisions, I think in almost every league of, of consequence, and football clubs were like, well, you've got a list of information there that would be particularly useful for us. So I want a, I want a left back who is fast, suddenly the 10 available left backs who are under 22. Exactly. It's in the computer again. And this is stuff that the clubs are paying for. Well, and obviously I mentioned earlier on that we've been approached by quite a few of the MLS clubs because they're in a unique position that they have a very, very restrained budget. So what happens is you've got your marquee players, but then you've got the rest of your squad and that's the key to being successful. And these players earn between three and four grand a week, which in, in football terms isn't actually that much. And obviously, they want a slight advantage on the other teams. So the way it works in terms of the markets they were looking at, they were looking at, say, Central America, some of the South American markets, Eastern Europe, North Africa, but areas where there wasn't a lot of information available. So they approached us and said, OK, when we traditionally look at players, we, we identify who we might want to have a look at, we'll contact their agent, and the agent will send over a DVD. But as we all know, we could all look like Zenazine Zidane with the right balls.ie editor <laughs> uh, putting together a DVD. So what happened was they said, OK, you're impartial. You've got, you've got the data in these areas. This, these, are, these are the background checks that we want to look at. So, We've been providing that to some of the MLS teams, and they've been signing players accordingly. Yeah. I, I, Simon, I wonder, at what point do mainstream football clubs fully embrace data as one of the four or five most important things that go into every decision? Are, are we nearly there, do you think? With some clubs, we're already there, absolutely. I mean, a manager like Arsene Wenger, uh, Pep Guardiola, when he became manager of Bayern Munich, Apparently he walks into the club and he said to staff, the most important department in the club is the data department. Uh, Louis van Gaal is very data driven, so there's a huge amount of that. Managers don't like to talk about it much because um, it's still laughed at in some circles and they don't want to give away their secrets. So there's much more data analysis ha happening inside the game than you ever hear about. And I mean, I was speaking to this one data analyst at Everton, and he said when you watch TV and you hear the pundits, I mean, we were talking about this earlier, it's apparently also a problem in Ireland, Football's discussed as if it's kind of a manager's motivation, the manager really got them up for it, and then a player's moment of inspiration, and then a blunder. So it's just decided by these moments. But he says inside the club, we talk about it in a much more analytical way. There's a total disconnection between the way it's discussed on TV and the way it's discussed inside the clubs increasingly. Why do you think that punditry hasn't yet caught up? Is it, is it because there is still a lot of secrecy about it and the old school professional who would have been on the managerial merry-go-round is a little bit suspicious of this because, frankly, kids are coming in with college degrees and saying, well, you're, you're making very bad decisions there, mate. Yeah, I mean, the old school professionals were suspicious. I mean, there's a story of Harry Redknapp wanting to sell Gareth Bale when he took over at Spurs. And the uh, head of the Spurs data department says to him, and Harry Redknapp's, of course, very suspicious of uh, 
some data cruncher. <laughs> but the data cruncher says, look, you know, Gareth Bale, uh, he runs consistently at 30 kilometers an hour. Um, that's not a problem for him. And he'll run at 30 kilometers an hour. And then two minutes later, he'll do another sprint at 30 kilometers an hour. And he has very good passing accuracy. And these are very unusual characteristics. And we think running at 30 kilometers an hour, uh, Gavin Flegg of Manchester City said to me as well, you know, that ability to run at that speed repeatedly, we consider a mark of a top player. So Gareth Bale had that, Thierry Henry had that. Almost whenever Thierry Henry moved, he was going at 30k an hour. So the Harry Redknapp figure is suspicious of all this because he wants to say, look, I know the game because I played it, you didn't play, so yeah, I have power. My eye tells me, yeah. Yeah, my eye tells me. Billy Bean, who's the kind of father of, one of the fathers of data in sport, the Oakland A's guy, Billy Bean says, I don't believe my eyes because I've seen magicians pull rabbits out of hats and I just knew the rabbit wasn't in the hat. <laughs> so your eye can deceive you. I mean, like, just, just one example. At Chelsea once, they were discussing buying um, Alberto Aquilani, that was his name, Aquilani, isn't it? yeah. Yeah, and uh, someone said, he's a great goal scorer. And he wasn't, Aquilani never scored, but he'd scored one goal in the derby for Roma against Lazio from 30 meters, rockets in the top corner. And you remember that. You remember those moments, and those moments you remember that your eye recalls are deceptive because it's not the norm. You remember things that are extraordinary. Yeah, again, we were chatting before, and you were making the point about free kicks. Um, if you were put in charge of a football team, one of the first things you would do is tell people, you're not taking any direct free kicks. No yeah, shoot. No, in my team, nobody takes a direct free kick. I mean, imagine the free kick's here and the goal's there. What you always get is the number 10, the kind of star player, he picks up the ball, slicks back his hair, puts it down, <laughs> and then he bangs it 20 yards over the bar. <laughs> and the whole performance takes about two minutes. But what's happening is the other team has to put a wall up, because I'm here, the goal's there. So they have to put a wall up with three or four defenders. So suddenly, you can pass into a box where there are three or four defenders missing. It's an amazing opportunity. So I would say to the Cristiano Ronaldo figure, who, who just recently went 50 plus, maybe he's still doing it on this run, of 50 plus direct free kicks without scoring, that's Cristiano. I would say you have to pass. You know, there's space in the box. We can set up a, a play like an American football, and uh, you're going to pass. And the great new example in Europe is this club in Denmark, Michelin, which is totally stats-driven. Ten points clear at the top of the Danish league at the moment. And they're scoring a goal a game from free kicks, which is the highest race in Europe, and I bet they're doing it more or less, as I've described. They're a really interesting example of, of um, where this might all end up taking us. Uh, uh, maybe you might fill us in a bit in the background, or at least the, the part of it that you know, because the, the guy who owns them is actually an English guy who made all his money in betting by yeah. seeing some inefficiencies in betting markets. Exactly. He's an ex-hedge uh, fund manager. Matthew Benham is his name. Uh, he worked with Tony Bloom, who's the, the owner of um, Brighton and Hove Albion, and there was, a, there was a sort of acrimonious split there, but they both obviously own football clubs in the same division and are, and are in the same business. Because he, he bought Brentford. He bought Brentford, exactly. Yeah. So Brentford um, went down the exact same data route, room, route as uh, Meadowland that uh, Simon mentioned, but they actually have a spin-off company called uh, The 21st Club, and they provide all of this, it's, it's insight into the data as opposed to just generating the data because we, we've had a situation where people have just been generating streams and streams of data but they haven't necessarily been able to get results out of it. We discussed earlier on that we, we all have looked at stats and various players' stats, but one of the areas that it's very, very difficult to measure is defenders because particularly centre-halves because you could look at someone who has the highest tackles, the highest headers won, et cetera. But realistically, in terms of tackling, some of the best defenders we can, we can remember never made tackles. Yeah. They'd guide people to, diff to areas of, of the pitch where they don't necessarily, they're out of danger effectively. Yeah, so this, the, this English guy decided that he had a, a strategy for, I think, being able to compare teams in all divisions in Europe. There's some algorithm that they have that they're obviously not releasing because it's proprietorial. So if there's a team in the German second division who are currently outperforming, they believe they could see how well they would do against, say, Aston yeah. Villa, for example. And suddenly, when you do that, you can much more closely predict judge players. As well, yeah. Which is useful when you're betting, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, Michelin actually say uh, we're 10 points, we have 10 points more than we should be. We should have because they predict what their real results should be. Because in football, of course, the fact of luck is enormous. 
So um, you have to take that into account. Yeah, they did say that uh, the league position is never going to be the arbiter of success for us. It's going to be whether or not we're doing what we yeah. think is right. And it's attributes as well, because I, I actually saw some a, a report by the 21st club on West Bromwich Albion, and they said, based on the squad that they have, they're the 11th best performing team in, in the division. And obviously, they're, they're just above relegation. Yeah. So, but for the resources they have, they're obviously doing very, very well. Okay, so this type of stuff is beginning to filter through, but I, I don't know in Denmark if there's massive kind of annoyance at the fact that uh, they, they, they pluck a guy from, there's literally a guy from the German second division who they picked, who is there now, one of their star players, and they're shopping in lower divisions in Spain and Portugal as well, and suddenly they're able to win the league and, and qualify for Champions League football next year. I'm sure their fans are delighted, given that they haven't won anything ever in Denmark. So. Yeah, I'd never, I'd never heard of this club. I didn't know it was a club. So, yeah. uh, and just the, the other, the other thing about the club is it's Rasmus Ankersen, who is the the chairman, who has obviously studied a lot to do with high-performing individuals. He wrote a book about that. Yeah, yeah. I think he's yeah. written about eight. He's quite prolific. Oh, really? Right. Okay, I lost track of the first one. Yeah. <laughs> I think he's 32 or 33, kind of. Yeah. He's yeah, very he's, high performance, obviously. Yeah, yeah. sickening. And a, yeah. An, an, an ex-professional himself, so uh, he's had uh, quite a few years. But interestingly enough, we've seen at Brentford, they've obviously been trying to evolve this model and roll it out, but th there's been the controversy that they've got rid of their manager. And uh, as we discussed earlier on, the manager of, of Brentford, uh, Mark Warburton, is an ex uh, foreign exchange trader in the city of London. So he understands data and how it works. So you get, the way that I read into this is, it gets to a point where you get that amount of data, but it has to be married up with reality at mm. the same time. So it's a question of where is that, that um, equilibrium? Yeah. yeah, at some point, understanding that some players are going through a bad time in their personal life and probably need rested, does have some bearing on whether or not they should play but maybe we vastly overrate that quality in, in a manager. I think we vastly overrate the psychological side of the game. So um, the managers lost the changing room. Ferguson was a great motivator. Um, the media loves to talk about the psychology of football. Obviously, psychology matters, but it's vastly, vastly <laughs> overrated. I mean, the idea is that it's a game that's about desire, and um, the manager can give you that desire, but it, it's, it treats football as like five-year-olds. So the footballer is there, and then the manager infuses him with desire, and he plays. <laughs> and also, it completely forgets that if you play for Manchester United, you're being judged by millions of people every week. Every game you play, there's this mass judgment made on you. If you perform badly, you will disappear from the top of the game. So that is the motivation of a footballer. It's not because he loves Manchester United. It's not because he listens to the manager. The footballer's motivation to perform is very largely his own career. So managers are infinitely less significant than we think. Psychology is infinitely less significant than we think. And the secret of the game is somewhere in the data, but we haven't quite found it yet. Because as Carlo Ancelotti says, the problem is the player doesn't have the ball for 89 minutes a game. So the data tell you a lot about what he's doing on the ball, his pass completion, for example, in the last third of the field. But how do we know what he's doing in the other 89 minutes? I mean, as Tom was saying about shielding the attacker, that kind of thing, when the ball isn't even there. How do we know whether that's good or bad? That's, that's the problem that we're now trying to crack. Yeah, in basketball, what they've done is they've put uh, the entire court, covered it with cameras, so every sector and every sphere is analysed and each data point is collected for those players. Football, because of the size of the pitch, is so much bigger and there are already three times, four times the amount of players. Do we get to a point ever where we fully understand? I mean, is well, it almost inevitable? It's, it's almost at that stage now with the, the, way, the way Prozone actually analyze and Prozone and Amisco be the two biggest in, this, in that area. They've done the same thing with the cameras. It mightn't be quite at the level that it is in the NBA, but it, it's, I'd say it's almost there. And then obviously we've got other areas like the stat sports that the Irish rugby team use. And the fact that you can use that uh, in in game is fantastic from a, a, an intensity point of view because yeah. I remember going to uh, 
an England training session before they were playing uh, Switzerland, and they were all wearing the GPS tracking vests, including Fraser Forrester, who I don't think moved for the, the whole 90 minutes. He was literally playing in, a, in the better team, so I don't know what data they got out of that. But speaking England and goalkeepers, and Matthew Benham, and obviously psychology, you'll have to tell everyone about the, the penalties. Yeah, Matthew Benham's analysis of why does England lose, which, as you know, is the kind of main subject of conversation in Britain. Is, um, <laughs> and it, over here, to be honest. <laughs> <coughs> for different reasons. Is, um, he says it's mostly just luck. He says, why don't England win World Cups? World Cups is a very small sample of games. And um, England have gone out six times in the last ten tournaments on penalties. And he says you can improve your penalty taking through practice a bit, but not reliably very much. So he says, if you're going to explain why England has had a barren nearly 50 years, mostly luck. You know, I mean, they're never going to be a Germany that are always up there, but they're a kind of second-ranked team who've been a bit unlucky. Well, this might be a good time to talk a bit about uh, Daily Blend. You, you yeah. want to show us a video? Uh, yes, let's, let's see. Yeah, let's have a look at the video, please. Yeah, but before, <coughs> just before we start, this is a very unremarkable moment of play, and if you watch Daily Blind, who's now playing for Manchester United, but this is two years ago, he's playing for Holland under 21s against Germany under 21s. The Germans attempt to 1 2, and Blind runs along with a player. If you just watch this. This is one reason, this video is one reason Germany won the World Cup. Lidl will nader the last 10 minutes. So the Germans are about to try one, two. In the prevalent minute, the strafstop for Jong Duitsland. Uh, Sorry, you can remember, he's from chasing the ball, now he's uh, with the man, he's staying with the man. Attack peters out. It's one of the most boring well, incidents of play you'll see, nothing happens. Now, before we show it again, the German national team, they have an app. For months before the World Cup, all the players were on the app, and they would put videos on the app, because players like watching videos, and videos are a good way of learning. And the data analysts uh, got very interested in this particular video of Blinz because he, what he was doing was the perfect way to cut out a one-two. And before France played Germany, the data analysts started to highlight it on the app for the players because France are a country where one-two is a big part of the football culture. And so this team, they, uh, Pogba would hit a pass to Benzema and Benzema would then play a one-two with Pogba. And so the Germans said to the players, Watch how Blint cuts out the one-two. Let's watch it again. Thanks very much. They do well. Now that the last so the Germans have watched that daily Blint, what he is doing is, is the perfect way of cutting out a one-two, which is he ignores the ball. He just stays with the player. And everyone's instinct is to chase the ball. You're near the ball, you, you go for it, but then you leave the man unmarked. So the Germans watch this repeatedly before the France quarter-final, which they won one-nil. They watched it repeatedly before the Brazil semi, because I think the Latins are big on one-twos. I mean, the whole history of the England football team, nobody's ever played a one-two. <laughs> but the French, the Brazilians, and then the Argentinians, they all play one-twos. So the Germans watched that video repeatedly, and the German uh, data, chief data analyst, uh, he showed this to a Dutch colleague of mine, this video, and he said, the headline for your story should be how Daily Blind saved the German World Cup. He said, that's how important it was. So these tiny moments... Uh, analysed, spotted by the performance analysts and then shown to players, this is increasingly how training works. And it's interesting from that video that, that Simon said, there's a lot on data, but at the end of the day that was picked up by an analyst who's obviously just looking at the video. Yeah. You would never have been able to pick that up on, on a pro zoner and a misco. No he matter. the ball. Exactly. There, there is you can see no the run, but yeah. you don't know the context that it's in. Yeah. This is... This is the bit where the people who can interpret this are going to get very rich in football. Yeah, if you can work out, if you can show a data pattern for how to stop one-twos, then that is very interesting. Or if you can show a data pattern how a team fails to cut out one-twos, that is very interesting. But, you know, the, the naked eye can be useful if you watch videos repeatedly, but not, oh, I saw the guy not one in from 30 yards once, therefore he's a goal scorer. The, the basketball stuff in 2009, Michael Lewis, who ends up writing Moneyball, wrote the No Stats All-Star about this basketballer who never showed up in the stats. Everybody kind of thought this guy, he's, he's a marginal NBA athlete was how they referred to him. And yet every time he was on the field, they have this plus or minus points differential. Every time he was on the court, his points differential for the team was plus 10, which is kind of up there with the three greatest superstars in the NBA season. And nobody could really understand it until they, they started to analyze how he prevents the opposition from scoring. 
and uh, this guy was at the Houston Rockets, and so the, the data revolution, everybody started to cotton onto it there. In baseball, it goes back to Billy Bean, and Billy has kind of been flirting with, um, certainly for, with The Guardian for a long time about getting involved in the Premier League. Eventually, a Dutch team have taken the plunge and they've got involved with him. Why have they got involved with him, and what do you think he's going to bring to AZ Alkmaar? Well, Billy Bean is the guy who brought stats into Major League Sport with the Oakland A's, because he, he was an ex-athlete, kind of typical old pro, but with a massive brain, unusually. And he started to read these <laughs> statistical reports and say, you know what, these kind of nerdy statos, they've found out a lot of secrets of baseball, did that at the A's, the A's massively overperformed. The last 10 years, he's become a soccer nut. He watches soccer obsessively, unhealthily, and listens to podcasts like, you know, the ones you guys do. And um, so he, was, he wants to apply statistical insights to football, but he knows, you know, he's not really a soccer man. He's not someone who's played the game forever, thought about the game forever. So he's cautious. And I think starting with a smaller Dutch club is a good way for him to learn. So he's staying at the A's. He's going to advise AZ Alkmaar, one of whose leading uh, technical directors is an ex-baseball player who played in America for many years, yeah. Robert Einhorn. So Einhorn asked Bean, and Bean said, yeah, that's the perfect way for him to start. So it's a dipping your toe into the water. Yeah, trying to provide some models from the A's, uh, do some data crunching, because all baseball teams now have teams of statisticians. I mean, when I met Billy Bean in Oakland a couple of years ago, his right-hand man was an MIT economics PhD, I think, called Farhan Zaidi, who's now general manager of the Los Angeles Dodgers. So an MIT guy who's never played baseball makes the decisions at the LA Dodgers, imagine that in football. Yeah. <laughs> so they have a lot of knowledge on stats, which they can give to a football club. It's probably sensible from Billy's perspective. Like, when you're earning 12 million a year at the Oakland A's, you're not going to go, you know, completely knees deep in, into, into the Premier League. Um, the, the other thing is, dipping, the, dipping your toe in is, is probably the best description because we've seen other examples, probably the most high profile of which was Clive Woodward when he went to Southampton, yeah. who basically thought that he knew everything because he'd obviously masterminded England to winning the, the Rugby World Cup. And, he was ultimately a failure in, in terms of what he did at Southampton, and they rebuilt and turned into like one of the best youth-producing teams in, in Europe. Yeah, so it's not a straightforward thing to transplant sport or success from one sport to another. Maybe Sir Clive seemed to be a, a bit more of that uh, less statistical, a bit more motivational. You know, it definitely seemed that at the end, anyway. And he wasn't humble. I mean, Billy Bean's very humble about, yeah. I, I don't know soccer, soccer is different. And he also says, you know, you're never going to win the game with data. But he said, if it gives you a 5% edge, that's enough. If, you know, you're playing against Bayern Munich and you get 5% extra thanks to data, you have to do it. That... Um example we saw of the Daily Blind interception or uh, non-1-2 that happened, for Germany to be able to use that requires the Yogi Love figure to be open to someone tapping him on the shoulder and saying, here, you should, you need to, like, you gotta, we got to do this. Is that because that culture is there or is that because he's part of that culture? Um, the Germans have had sports science in universities since 1919. I think the first chair of sports science was founded at the Humboldt University of Berlin in 1919. So they totally were open to it, were receptive to it. In England, there was receptivity because people read Moneyball. Because, you know, obviously the Brits are very close to America. And so when Moneyball came out, a lot of people read it. So there were people, not everyone, but there were people in football who said, all right, this could work for us. Yeah. And so, yeah, it very much depends on what the top, the top dog in the club, because clubs are still run like kind of North Korean style dictatorships. So <laughs> if, if the manager doesn't buy in, not much happens. Yeah, because um, we were talking a little bit beforehand about the decision making process for signing a player for 15 million quid. And uh, we had one of the Arsenal scouts in with us um, on Saturday talking about this. And it's part of his job to go and view a player. and. We were like, well, obviously, you see him loads and loads of times. Like, no, you've got to make your decision really quick for the manager. He wants to know, are we going on this or not? And presumably, there's a, a big, there's a load of stuff in the background before that decision is made from the scouts. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, it's identifica identification. And Arsenal have bought a, bought a specific package that they use exclusively uh, called Stat DNA. I think they paid two, $2 million for this a couple of seasons ago. And... 
that obviously has tailored the stats to the way Arsenal play football and what they're trying to achieve, usually fourth place. Um, but Gabriel, the, the, the recent Brazilian signing in the transfer window, uh, he was basically signed almost exclusively from that. They, the scouts did go over and look at him, but at the end of the day, if you look at the way Arsenal in particular have conducted their business, they have almost had every single talent on their radar, and a lot of the times they haven't moved. Mm. So maybe the, the rationale for what you just described, mm. dwelling on the likes of Eden Hazard or Peter Cech or these type of players, is probably the reason why they never got them in the first place. Yeah. So maybe they need to move for that. So maybe that's a, an actual change in culture, perhaps. The, the other thing that we, we touched on earlier on as well was relating to uh, agents and the fact that certain clubs just don't have access to agents and can't get players for that, for that rationale. Sorry, Simon, you, you were going to come in with something there, were you? I was going to do some horrendous name-dropping, so why don't you go, <laughs> go for it? Go for it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I hate name dropping. I hate, you know, I'm not that kind of person at all. But I was with Arsene Wenger in Paris last week and I gave him my book. <laughs> <laughs> As I said to Barack Obama. Uh, I see. And Wenger, I think, is, he never reads books because life is too short. So when he met Nick Hornby, he had, who wrote the book about Arsenal, he had no idea who Nick Hornby was. And he was astonished that um, anyone could make a living from writing books. <laughs> so he said to Nick Hornby, are you okay? Do you get by? Do you survive? And Nick Hornby, who's about the richest, you know, richest writer in the world, said, I'm okay, it's okay. <laughs> anyway, so I knew uh, Wenger wouldn't read the book, but on the cover is an endorsement from Billy Bean saying this is a good book. And Wenger read the cover and he said, Billy Bean, I know him very well. And Billy Bean was at Wenger's house. I mean, I'd seen them in this three-hour conversation at this conference in London once, which I obviously didn't dare to interrupt. But Billy Bean was at his house before the FA Cup semi final, so they talk all the time. So Wenger's getting it. He, he's an economics graduate. He can solve maths puzzles. And he gets a huge amount of information, both uh, personal and uh, impressionistic, and also statistical. I mean, the guy locks himself up with stats sheets. So I think when he asks the scout, judge this player now, he's putting together a lot of impressions from different people because the way to make good judgments is the wisdom of crowds. Yeah. And um, you, you don't want to say, I'm the manager, I flew in, I saw him, he played well, so I'm going to sign him. That's disastrous. You want to have five people watch him and stats and call people who know the player. And then based on that combined wisdom, you make a decision. Yeah. Simon, why do you think then that he didn't sign a goalkeeper and a centre-back for the last couple of years? Well, I, funny you should mention that, was doing this analysis very geekily, of uh, using Optus stats of the best keepers in the Premier League. Now, the best keeper in the Premier League, according to these stats, the last two and a half years, was Lukas Fabianski, who Wenger did sign, kept on the bench, basically, but did sign him. Also, very highly ranked keepers the last two and a half years were Vita Manone and uh, Chesney, who Wenger also signed. So, at one point, I think he had all three of them at the Emirates at the same time. He signed three very good keepers. I think he put the wrong one in goal. He should yeah. have put Chesney in goal, but should have put Fabianski. But I think we... Um, if Fabianski had been in goal, Arsenal might have finished a bit higher. But I mean, I think we give Arsenal too hard a time because what wins football matches is not data. What wins football matches is money. And Arsenal just have less of it, or willing to spend less of it. So Arsenal have about the fourth wage bill in the Premier League, typically. And so they usually finish third or fourth, which is actually pretty good. OK, so um, by that token earlier on, you're talking about West Brom finishing 11th, or they should be finishing 11th. It's probably safe to assume that perhaps Arsenal are about where they should be. Well, you're asking the wrong person here. I'm going to have to put my hands up and say that I'm an Arsenal fan. So uh, you think they should be first? <laughs> well, no, I think they're they're about right. I think I agree with Simon on that. Third's probably the best they're going to do. Yeah, they're, they're not going to beat Chelsea and Manchester City or, or United probably regularly over a whole season. Yeah, it's just players. The, the Oakland days obviously did end up. Um, they've never won a championship, but they've definitely kind of had record-breaking regular season wins and yeah. have vastly outperformed what their wage bill yeah. is. Is there any point where football will be, where there will be the data revolution to the point where a club can sustain a title run, for example? Like, maybe Atletico Madrid are doing something like this. I don't know. It's happened in lower football. So if you look at the, the actual uh, correlation between expenditure and um, league performance, in the championship consistently you see uh, some of the, the lesser spenders getting getting through. I, I did some analysis on this a couple of years ago and the, up until I think it was the first 20 seasons of the Premier League, the, the teams that went down finished on average ninth. 
So they weren't bouncing back up. And it's, it's one of those type of things that we can all remember the teams that have bounced back up, yeah. but at the end of the day, there's a lot that go, go down further. So we've, we've seen clubs getting relegated again out of the championship straight away after getting rele relegated out of the Premier League. Yeah. I, I, I'm wondering if there is a, an opportunity to be a breakout team, to be an Oakland A's in, in football, if you discover what it is. I think you can in a bad league. Like in Denmark, you can. Because if you do a few basic things right, driven by stats like the free kick thing, or you sign an, on a, a player who nobody has really noticed, then, you know, for, for not very much money. It works in a league like Denmark or, dare I say, Ireland. But in the Premier League, I mean, if you, if you can buy people like Eden Hazard or Yaya Toure or Sergio Aguero, that kind of quality ends up being usually decisive. So football is very much driven by the qualities of the best players, and the qualities of the best players are quite obvious. Like, you don't need data to see that Messi's good. Yeah. You just need money to buy him. You do need data to see that a guy in the German second Bundesliga is better than everyone thinks. I think at the top, uh, quality is more apparent and therefore data is less important. And the player makes a lot of data-driven decisions himself. Whereas in baseball, I mean, like the decision not to steal bases, which the Oakland A's made, is one that you can make as a club. But in football, the decision to hit that pass or not hit that pass is one that the player makes. So uh, the data analysis done by the players in a spontaneous way is more important. Yeah, it's also possible in football that what you're doing might be very good for your stats. Like if you're Cristiano Ronaldo, you're never going to pass to the guys in a slightly better position. You're going to take the shot if you think you're going to score the goal. Um, and you can't really, you can't force that out of a, a player. You can tell them not to do it, but ultimately they're going to do what's best for them. There's a selfishness involved in, in, in sport and in football where you get rewarded for being selfish. And you're also now seeing players play, to, play for the data. So at Hertha Berlin, for example, somebody was saying that they were judged by the previous manager on duels, which is this German concept, doesn't really exist anywhere else, but a duel as in a kind of sword duel where you fight for the ball with somebody else. So duels won and Columbus has run. So all the Hertha players knew I'm being judged on duels won and Columbus has run. Now this Japanese player is very good, but one game he only won two duels and all the players saying in the changing room, he's going to be dropped, and he was. So what players do in that situation is that the last 20 minutes they do a huge amount of running. <laughs> so yeah. that when you look at the stats at the end, they've all run 14 kilometers. And that's not necessarily what you want. So I think more and more players are playing for that. And that yeah. was one of the, the sort of primitive metrics at the start, wasn't it? That, four, kilometers that 14 run. kilometers, like yeah. if anyone was up around that level, that's people amazing. were looking at them. It was like yeah. the Garrett Bale 30 yeah. kilometers average that you were talking about well, earlier. Well, the, the sprint, which is now the more fashionable yeah. thing than the, the total run. But, Wenger thinks that the total number of kilometers run is significant. You know, I mean, the, the consensus now, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. But he says, if you're running 14K and the guy, your op opposing number is running 12K, often the difference is in the last 10 minutes. And if you're making runs into the penalty area in the last 10 minutes and the other guy's not picking you up, that can be very significant. So. Yeah. Uh, Damien Camoli took a lot of flack from the Liverpool fans for signing the players that he did sign. <laughs> Ultimately, he stands over them. I think he thinks that they worked. He, he thinks that Gareth Bale worked. Um, and it seems like he was trying to interpret the data and trying to yeah, be yeah, yeah. at the, the, just that point. He might just have been a season ahead of it. He, I mean, he made a couple of mistakes. I mean, buying Andy Carroll was based on... Carroll heads, if you hit crosses the, into the air, the best person to head in that cross is Andy Carroll. But hitting high crosses is a really crap way to play football because uh, it's very hard to regularly score from high crosses. So it was the wrong kind of football. But if you're going to play the wrong kind of football, Andy Carroll's the best man to play it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but using stats, he, he did. I mean, this is a guy who brought Luis Suarez, Gareth Bale, and Luka Modric into the Premier League. And uh, the sign of Sorry. Hugo, Hugo Lloris, Lloris as well. Yeah, he, he wanted to bring him and then they bought him after they sacked him. Yeah. Because uh, Lloris had amazing goalkeeping stats. Whereas Paul Robinson, the then Spurs keeper, had completely terrible ones. But because he was an English goalkeeper, you didn't even need stats to know that. He yeah, yeah. <laughs> strike him based on nationality. <laughs> okay, some um, questions coming in on our hashtag science balls. Hi, everybody out there. Uh, how are players reacting to the new world where you just can't hide from stats? Do they look at. It? It's very interesting because obviously the, the TV3 program that David Bentley did recently, one of the main reasons he could still be playing football, no problem, probably high end of League One, lower level championship, no problem. But he fell out of love with the game because he just 
did, he didn't like the fact that it, would, it was becoming a mechanical exercise. Yeah. And I think the last generation of players, when we had all of those sort of artists, really, like your Zolas, your, your Burkamps, your Letitiaes, that slow sort of speed of thought player just doesn't exist in, in the league anymore, really, because, you know, again, if you looked at their stats, it's not going to look very good in terms of movement, etc. Kebabs eaten might be good for a Letitia, but that's about it. Yeah. I think also uh, football has just got better. And so if you're now playing against someone like Riquelme, who is a great slow player, you say, OK, Riquelme has this huge weakness in that he has zero pace. So we're going to spend the whole week working out how to exploit that, yeah. and we're going to exploit it. And so I think that because it's more sophisticated, because it is faster, because it is better, uh, any weakness is punished. In a way, our Wenger and Mourinho, the Billy Beans of football, and that we're actually doing this a little bit wrong in, in that. So they're guys who didn't have full-time professional mm. careers or yeah. magnificent careers. They're not the Roy Keynes of this world who walks straight into a job and get hailed as a world-class manager, even though he doesn't have any track record. And that the sports are so different that they're the, actually the prototype of the revolutionary figures who come from mm. a slightly different angle and a different take. Yeah, well, Mourinho says, um, why do non-players do better as managers? He says, more time to study. But actually, Mourinho, I'm told, doesn't actually use data. He doesn't find them interesting. All right. He does video analysis. Yeah, and I think um, Andre Villas-Boas obviously came from his stable and, and Brendan Rodgers as well. But Villas-Boas was massively into data. And I think at the end of it, that might have been part of, of their split when, when he moved on. Um, I think they're both very different, though. I think I agree with Rafa Benitez is another one who never really had a career, but it, from an analysis point of view, was, was an excellent manager and was able to pick out weaknesses in, in yeah. teams. So definitely that's come through. It's funny because you, you speak to a lot of people, particularly at the LMA, and they'll say that there's lots of English coaches coming through in, in a similar vein, a little bit like Mark Warburton that we discussed earlier on. Um, and that they don't get looked at because they don't have a foreign accent, basically. Yeah. So it, it's sort of a little bit sexier to come from overseas. Yeah. It will be interesting to see if any of them actually end up making the breakthrough because you've got to assume that there are a bunch of people looking at this and thinking, well, here is my competitive advantage. Yeah. And the clubs don't want the Roy Keynes anymore. I mean, the Roy Keynes, Brian Robsons, Ruth Hullitz, Diego Maradonas, they, they can't get a job in football. So definitely clubs are much more interested in the Mourinho model of, of manager. Yeah, okay. I'm going to open this up to uh, questions from the floor. Yeah, so watch your head there. Uh, hi, Jeff. Hi, uh, Simon. Uh, hi, Tom. Um, <laughs> hi, Nick. Uh, hi, Jeff. Um, when the England cricket team were knocked out of the World Cup, uh, the England coach, Peter Moores, famously said, uh, we have to look at the data. Um, unfortunately for the England cricket team, uh, the game changed within that World Cup. Uh, innovative captaincy meant that, that the England data was completely out of date after the first game. Is there a danger of uh, football teams and sports teams uh, relying too much on data and not in innovating enough uh, within matches and within tournaments? Do you, do you want to take that? I mean, data is just a supplementary tool. And, yeah, you have to keep thinking. Like, so Guardiola invented the best football in the world, developed the best football in the world of Barcelona, and he comes to Bayern Munich, and he changes it. He says, OK, now the fullbacks are going to go into central midfield when we have the ball. And nobody had ever done this before. So, yeah, football keeps changing slowly, updating slowly. You have to keep doing that. And sometimes data can point you towards how to do that. There, there's never a fixed point where the development of the game ceases. I mean, in the 70s, people ran four kilometers a game. Now they average, I think, something like 12 kilometers a game. So it's a completely different sport. So, yeah, you have to... It's definitely down to interpretation. I, I completely agree. And, you know, evolution of games, it, it's key. Because I think it's, it, it has more influence in some of the American sports where you can actually have timeouts and almost analyze these things in real time. I know the rugby guys do it as yeah. well. And they're very, very good. And a lot of the systems, I know we, we discussed Opta earlier on. And, and obviously, they're an interesting model because they started off pro providing data from, from media, and then they obviously had a, a reverse entry into, into professional sports, but they're one of the main providers in, in terms of cricket as well. 
uh, but it's all down to how you interpret that and ultimately how the coach interprets it. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, I suppose we can be obsessed in the media by sometimes the wrong things as well. And that, that's, like that conversation that's happening in the media is what people expect. It's like, it's about desire. You know, that's kind of, that I completely remember when Ireland beat Holland 1-0 at Lansdowne Road, the first thing that Eamon Dunphy said afterwards, it's about desire, Bill. And then they show, they show the Roy Keane tackle on Overmars and, you know, it's hard to argue with that. <laughs> There's this amazing fact that during the World Cup, uh, Spain, beat, Spain lost to Chile. And Nate Silva, who's a brilliant statistical analyst, an example to us all, not a big soccer... He doesn't know much about soccer anyway. He's at the game. And Nate Silva, statistical genius, tweets, I guess Chile just wanted it more. <laughs> <laughs> so he's gone with the Dunphy analysis. He's completely deserted any kind of... And no, it wasn't they wanted it more. Spain also wanted to win the match. Uh, well, that leads me to my next question from uh, Liam. Do the panel and Jura believe there's an appetite for database sports journalism as this grows, a sort of European 538? Do you think there is? That, like, I think there is. I think there's definitely a market. You tell us. You run, well, run pe a website. People that, showed that up here. It's nice uh, you know, to, to talk. And I think people are getting fed up with the stupidity in football discourse. And I turned on the BBC World Service the other day listening. And Sunderland just appointed Dick Oldfacas as manager. And so they got a Sunderland next player, Julio Arca, to talk in not very good English about it. And he said, and it's this string of incredibly inane, stupid cliches that lasts for about two minutes. And he says, uh, yeah, um, obviously he's an experienced manager. Obviously it's going to be difficult to stay up. Obviously I hope we'll stay up. And it goes on like this. And sitting there, I was remembering when I wrote only about sport for many years, your brain slowly rots. <laughs> it gets worse and worse, you become more and more stupid, and at the end of the process, you're actually interested in the manager's press conference. And I think we are all feeling this, this sense of rot. And um, I mean, there's this one example, Jamie Carragher, in his very good book, cites it. Benitez and Ferguson are having this kind of punch-out press conference versus press conference one season. And Menezes comes in, he gives his press conference, and the media perceive that it was a bad press conference. He didn't show enough desire, didn't show enough psychological power. And they write, that press conference lost them the league. And Cara has said, no, nobody cares about the press conference. The players win the league or the players lose the league. And so this incredibly stupid, you know, what Mourinho said about Wenger stuff, I, I think there are enough people who just don't want to hear that anymore. Yeah, the whole narrative that we're supposed to believe that... The soap opera. Yeah, that Alex Ferguson killed uh, Keegan that night, that Keegan had the headphones on. Yeah. But actually, Newcastle blew that because they had a nine-point lead earlier in the season. And, and their players weren't as good as United's players. As my and they changed their team with a couple of weeks to go by signing Tino Esprit and totally changed the balance of the... It's good to watch, though. It was great to watch, is the thing. And I don't know, maybe... Maybe a little bit of soap opera and yeah. a little bit of fact, or some fact, any facts would be you an improvement. Need, you need some soap opera because otherwise nobody would watch football, but a little bit of intelligence would be nice. Yeah. Um, okay, so David Power on Twitter says, my thesis in economics at Trinity used stats to prove whether hometown referees existed, i.e. were biased. The MLS was worse than Serie A, apparently. Very good. Which, which year in, in Serie A was it? Was the year when all the, the referees were paid off? <laughs> Just after uh, Calciopolo. That, that is a confounding factor, of course. If you're bribing people, then hometown advantage is a matter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe you need to um, go back and redo your thesis yeah. in economics there, uh, David. But thanks for that. Um, at Sport for Business says, baseball, the NFL, rugby, all incredibly stop-go. Soccer and GAA are more fluid. Does that make analysis by data less of an influence? It's actually not that incredibly complicated. I mean, in basketball, which is also quite a fluid game, they've been able to make predictions. And Marcus de Sotoy, who is the professor of maths at Oxford and a former player of the England writers team, which I'm also a former player, so we're, we're ex-teammates, he says, actually, the football field is not that complicated. You don't have that many infinite permutations, and players tend to stay in certain zones. So it's not like it's this incredibly random blur. He says you can, you can see patterns quite obviously. It's not Brownian motion, yeah. it's something... Yeah, I mean, you know, they, they can predict the weather, so to some degree you can predict a football match. Yeah. It, it's harder to obviously interpret it and, and get those interpretations onto the field straight away because of the reasons that, that he describes in his text. But obviously it, it, it depends on, uh, on when you're trying to in, implement it. If, if Brentford come up on the back of 
somebody who's driving stats into it and they become a, an established Premier League team, does that mean that we're going to see five or six more immediately follow suit? English Definitely. football in particular is... I, well, Simon's obviously spent a lot of time behind the scenes at clubs, as have I, to be honest. And, you know, there's a lot of clubs that are just scared to be the first mover. You know, they, they stay within the status quo, but certain clubs do try and innovate. I'm a Villa fan. I don't understand why the hell they're not doing this all the time, because <laughs> they're, they're so far behind. Mm. There's no sense of them doing anything that's innovative. There's almost no reason for them to exist. Particularly with an American owner as well, who's, who's obviously yeah. grown up through all of this and been a franchise owner in the NFL. Yeah, I mean, if, if I were at Villa, I would say, how are we going to compete? We have to compete being like the Oakland A's because we're always going to have worse players than United or Chelsea. Let's not sign Kieran Richardson would be the first thing I would do. But uh, <laughs> uh, Derek McDonagh wants to know, does Simon see any relation between the arguments for the use of data in sport and the use of data for the governance of cities? You're an anthropologist, I think it's fair to say. Do you? No, my dad's an anthropologist, but I'm happy to assume the mantle. No, um, the, you, you've had <laughs> this enormous degree. generation. Yeah, I'm, I'm now, uh, yeah, do you feel? <laughs> you have this enormous generation of data in every field in the last 20 years. And one thing is... Um, the Internet of Things. So you put sensors on football players and you put sensors on cyclists. So the sensors on the cyclists tell you about how people use the city. The sensors on football players tell you about how they use the field. So you've got the same phenomenon happening and you've got the same problem, which Tom stipulated, which is a problem of big data. There's too much data. And you've got these enormous quantities of data coming in. I mean, you're generating these enormous quantities yeah. of data. So if you're Aston Villa and you have football manager, and you're probably just two guys in a shed without a maths degree, it's too much. And so you need uh, people, probably people like Tom, who can say, this is what that means, this is what that means, why don't you think about that? So we're in this situation now in the world of too much data in cities, in football, and everything. We're scared of it. it it's just overwhelming, yeah. And the data don't always just speak. I wouldn't say we're scared of it. I'd say it's more, uh, as Simon said, you have to it's a question of interpretation and, and getting the right data. I've seen, um, let's just say, clubs in the UK in particular that have paid for every system. So they'll have, you know, Prozone, Amisco, Y Scout, uh, Scout 7. They'll have the works. They're expensive, right? Yeah, they're very, very expensive. But they, they don't have uh, proper people to interpret what, what they're getting. Yeah. So effectively they'd be better off you know canning one or two of these systems and actually just paying to get a decent person in who, c who can give them what they need i don't want to break any confidences there was a team recently who played a big game and their head of analysis saw the manager's stats or the manager's plans and he immediately knew that they had no chance of success in the big game yeah and Again, we, we won't necessarily mention the team, but a, a Champions League team um, that were playing a very, very good uh, Spanish team, <laughs> and, uh, or Catalan, depending on what your political viewpoints are. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, head, the heads of, 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 of basically analysis looked at that and just said, OK, this is the way that, that the Catalan team are going to approach um, pressing the ball, etc. whereas our three midfielders are going to just get completely run out by about the 60th minute, which is the way it actually happened in the game. Yeah, so at some point there will be an owner who says, I'm spending a billion on this and I want to make sure that when I look at you in the whites of your eyes, I know you've done all the work. Well, the thing is, the data is cheaper than the players, the, and the, stati the statisticians are cheaper than the players. You're playing a player in the Premier League on average two and a half million pounds, so for that you can hire, you know, 50 statisticians. So it sh they should be doing it, and to, so to some degree they are doing it, but the manager doesn't always listen. And you have this problem, like um, with Soconomics, got together with a couple of people. We found this kind of Soconomics consultancy, which has been a total failure in terms of selling to football clubs, because we went to um, Fulham. And we said, we can analyze penalties that, you know, Fulham are involved in about 10 or 15 penalties a year when they're in the Premier League. And we can help you probably save two more penalties than you're saving now. And that's probably worth one or two points. And in the Premier League at the time, you pay a million pounds for a point yeah. in budget terms. And we said, we charge you less than a million pounds for each point. And um, the CEO was very interested because he, he saw it was a cheaper way to buy points than buying players. And he went to Mark Hughes, who was the manager, and Mark Hughes said, I played football, 
Penalties don't work like that. So what do you say? You know, so there is this fading generation of the ex-player who doesn't believe it. But those people are being ousted. Yeah. And if you say that to Wenger or Mourinho, they say, oh, that's very interesting. Let me... And they already know yeah. a lot of that. Or and, more, they already know more than you can tell them. And they're obviously quite open to it. We've got a, another one over there if you want to throw the microphone. And another one over here too. <laughs> Catch. Confidence. It is, yeah. Just talk into it. Um, Peter Ross is my name. I have a background in uh, science and, and stat statistics as well. Um, just earlier on you said um, you downplayed the importance of psychology in sport. Um, my company, Life and Balance Centre, we work in um, objectively measuring your psychological state and then learning how to improve it or change it so you can learn how to get into the performance zone. Um, because when a soccer match is on, it's 90 minutes long. It doesn't matter what preparation you've done, how technically good you are. It's all about your state, your mental state during that game and decide whether you're going to win or lose the game, really. Um, so I suppose my, that's sort of an observation. But the question is, it would be great um, if we could combine some of that data with the data that's currently collected to have more of a rounded view of, of an individual. I mean, I'm sure psychology is very is important. I'm just saying that psychology is overstated in football discourse, and certainly motivation is overstated. And for me, the great example was Brazil at the last World Cup, because um, you know, talk about a team that really wanted it. Brazil really, really wanted yeah. it, and they they were motivated, and the players were crying. And there was a lot of passion, and they were completely rubbish. I think you're wrong. They wanted it too much. Was the answer? No, I think they were just <laughs> crap at football. <laughs> um, no, I think they. Um, they didn't know, Brazil have lost touch with how to play football. They don't know how to play football. And Germany and Spain know how to play football. And I mean, you know, you could get me really motivated and really improve my psychology, but if I went out to play in a World Cup, I wouldn't be good enough. So I think that there, were, there was a huge amount of other stuff that comes in. Another one over here. Hi, um, Tom Spines, my name. I'm a PA in rugby. So my question is, again, from the analyst side, not the data science side. At the moment, we have a proliferation of the 54% model coming through, or the statement of accounts, or whatever. You know, it's, it's outcome based, and we've coaches hiding behind that. Explain so, that, sorry, will you? The 54% yeah, so model. The 54% for... model. It's an outcome based model where you've got four or five data sets you'll, you'll manage through a game, and everything's based on an outcome. So you can have a positive. If you get and receive a ball, you're 22. Kick it two zones up and hit touch. That's a positive outcome for you. So as a coach, you're doing really, really well under data governance, but as a performance analyst I can say, well actually, their full back was on the wrong side, we've analysed their winger to know he's quite weak on the inside, our statistical chances under analysis would have been better if we'd spun the ball out wide. Now from the resulting lineup, you've basically just ran back and scored off us, but yet you got a positive point for that because you moved it two zones, and there's a lot of coaches that are hiding behind the data sets, and, say, you know, and they're developing games to play with this. And they're 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 using data without fully understanding it, and analysis is starting to slip back a little bit, and it's happening in rugby. I I, I don't know too much about our sports, so I'm wondering, do you have a, an opinion on that, or is it happening in other sports? Um, well, it's a great practical example, and I have to say, it is happening in other sports, and and that's it's again it's it's marrying the analysis with the information that's coming in with with the coaching and the tactics so i think you're absolutely spot on you, you can have a situation where i think a lot of the more primitive systems particularly in like my background is more in football it, they were exactly what you just described, where they'd almost give you these uh, key performance indicators and say, well, if you're doing this, you're doing great almost, whereas in certain instances, you're not. So it, it is a question of marrying that up, but I think it was a very good practical example. Sorry, the latest example internationally is Ireland, when they won the championship two years ago, didn't hit the 54%, sorry. Ireland, when they won the, the international championship two years ago, didn't hit the 54% in any of their games, but yet we're Six Nation champions. I'll drink to that. <laughs> we had another hand up there. Yeah. Down the middle here. It's a proper throw job. Yeah. Hey. Hey. How are you doing? Um, my name's Mark from a market research company called Ignite Research. Um, my question to the guys is, with all this onset of data, um, 
what's going to happen to the younger players? So you can imagine you're coming through a youth academy and there's uh, that analyst telling you, do this, do that. Is it going to remove the flair out of the game? And it, as an advantage of the question, are we seeing in the present day where we have obviously very good players, very you know technical players with flair, and obviously coaches are imposing the state on them, for example, Iniesta, Xavi, and are the players coming true? Are we just going to see that flair eradicated so we have no more, I don't know, Matt Letizia's or Gary Brains? From what I... <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's getting a prize anyway. Uh, from what I've seen, exactly what you just have described sadly is the case. Obviously, there are certain coaches and, you know, again, it's a generational thing. You'll have, let's just say, Dennis Burkamp looking after youth at Ajax and he's going to want players to, to play in a, in a flair sort of manner. But then you're going to have a situation where it's, it's controlled flair almost. So, and it's back to the David Bentley example that we spoke about earlier on. He was obviously quite a skillful player and just fell out of love with the game. So it, it, it is a knife edge that we all want to see those incredible pieces of skill. And that's the reason why we pay to go and watch professional sport. Um, so it is a huge danger. And I believe that that is the case, unfortunately. I think players are being trained to be data analysts themselves and that, that's how they're being raised. But I, I would say one counterpoint is the dribble becomes more important as defences become better. Because as defences are, are fitter and more intelligent, passing around them is much harder. Mm. And one guaranteed way to beat a defender is with a brilliant dribble. You dribble past him, you... So it, you saw at the World Cup that a player like Messi, a player like Neymar can make the difference solo, because otherwise the defence is just too closed for a team to pass its way around. So the premium on the dribble is, is higher now than it was in the 70s when essentially any old idiot could pass his way around a, you know, a hungover defence. <laughs> I, I think as well that's happened in rugby because the defences and our rugby analysts will be able to tell us about this, but the defences have become so much more organised and Probably. tighter that we're seeing sort of almost grubber style rugby league kicks going through or, or kicks over the top, etc. I'm glad he doesn't have a mic to say that's, no, <laughs> that that's not the case. <laughs> it's like your Theo Walcott. You were saying, obviously, you're a season ticket holder at um, at the Emirates, and you're like, why the hell is Walcott taking these? We're disasters from set pieces, and then you went and looked at the stats, and it turns out you're actually quite good at them. Yeah, but that was when he was injured. <laughs> <laughs> okay, another one from over there, I think. Yeah. Hey, just a question in relation to, um, as a sports fan, I love watching sport. With the amount of information that's there, particularly available to professional teams, is there a danger that there's too much information and it's, it's detracting from sports as a spectacle? And I've used examples of the recent Six Nations where the first four rounds were predictable, they were technical, some were boring, and then when the fifth round came around, it was almost like the, the data went out the window, teams just started playing to win. And also, GA teams, who I presume are using this data as well, the Dublin Derry game at the weekend, it was almost as if the managers were able to send their teams out. They knew exactly what they were, they were up against. Uh, and they were, they were telling their players to play a certain way to win the game. Mickey Hart even turned around and said, he, you know, he, he's not there to entertain. As a sports fan, I love watching sport. I love the unpredictability of it. With the amount of data there, it, is there a danger that we're going to go down the road of sport becoming predictable, too predictable, too technical? Um, you know. um, I... To be honest, Brew, I definitely agree with you on this. I think uh, it's just like the point that was made here in terms of the development of the, the younger players that you know we're, we're getting to a situation where everything has been controlled to the nth degree. So you know it, it it was a breath of fresh air to watch that last day of the Six Nations. Not not just saying that because we won it. That was fantastic. But at the end of the day. It, you know, if you weren't a rugby fan and you turned that on and saw that, that would actually encourage you to go out and watch rugby. But that's not what it's usually like, uh, which, you know, it, it is a little bit sad, but I think that's the same as it, the way everything has gone in terms of modern day life. There was that interesting question to Simon earlier on about the cities, but it's, just, it's the type of thing that everything has been recorded in life now. You don't get away with anything. So, um, and I think sport is no different. Football went through a, a period where it was dull and it was sterile and they changed the back pass rule and they gave the attacker the advantage on the offside rule and things improved. 
So there are there is a cyclical Caranaccio yeah. better attacking play came in and yeah that helped. But also um, Saki showed at Milan even before the back pass rule that you could win with attacking football because in the eighties people were thinking well either you play attacking football or you win and Milan show, showed a way to do both and then cry for Barcelona and then Guardiola updated that so I, I I think that football is more attractive than it was when I was a kid I think it is a, a better game partly because. It became a TV game, so the TV companies give you money, so you have to create entertainment. And 70s football wasn't very entertaining, because if, if Messi had played in the 70s, he would have been kicked out of football after about five games. And so that, they had to protect the Messis, the Cristianos, because they are what people watch TV for. Yeah. And so you're not allowed to foul anymore in that way. And so in some ways, it's a much more appealing, much more attractive game. And they're always going to be great dribbling players. And now they're being encouraged, which in the past they never were. I mean, Pelé was kicked out of a World Cup. Uh, Maradona was pretty much kicked out of the 82 World Cup. That wouldn't be allowed to happen now. So although what you, I agree with a lot of what you say, on the other hand, I think TV and you know, Rupert Murdoch has been great for football in a way. Well, funnily, they did allow Neymar to be kicked out of the World Cup. They, yes, that, that was a shock. I was in the stadium, and it was the saddest match of the World Cup because Neymar and James Rodriguez were kicked out of the, ma the same match yeah. uh, under the guidance of this idiot referee. And I think that was exactly what football used to be like yeah. and had stopped being. Maybe it's no harm being reminded of that. We've got one down here at the front. Time for one more question after this, so if anybody wants to be brave. Hi, lads. Uh, I'm Joe, and I'm a rugby analyst as well, actually. And... Uh, my question is kind of to do with a couple of them have already been asked. Uh, I'm working with a lot of the younger athletes now in rugby, and uh, a lot of the stuff we're kind of doing is where I have to make decisions and tell lads where you know whether whether that was effective and whether that worked and whether you should keep doing it. And a lot of the guys kind of come back and say, "Well, I think that that worked," and you know the guy didn't score a try or he didn't get past me, he didn't make gain lines, stuff like that. And then it's time where you kind of have to come to the player and show them the stats and show them the data and tell them, "Well, look." If you look back at the game, that's kind of it's what happened, and, and it's what it's what kind of came out the end. And I think, uh, do you think it's a, a problem that could come in where in future teams could end up like a, almost like a computer where every action is being decided two weeks before a match, where there's no creativity that can be left in the game, where it's all kind of developed from previous matches, and it's all done from it's no longer a spontaneous game, and there's no more creativity left in it. Just to go back to the basketball piece that I was talking about earlier on, this guy ends up marking Kobe Bryant and, and all the best scorers from the opposition. So there's always going to be the best players who are the scorers. We're kind of talking, I suspect, about making yeah. the, the middle-ranking teams very good or the very best teams amazing. And it shouldn't be at the detriment of... Yeah, but if you have Messi or Neymar in your team, you're not going to give them the, all those instructions. Those instructions are chiefly for the kind of defensive players, for everyone except the one or two creators. I suspect, I mean, I don't know much about rugby, but I suspect that in football it's much more like that. In the Barcelona changing room, they're not saying to Messi, these are your running patterns. So with, and Messi is just, obviously he's the supreme example, but with those kinds of players, you want them to make judgments in an instant. You want them to dribble because you don't want your right back to start dribbling, that would be a disaster. So you tell your right back, you're not allowed to dribble. But when, I mean, the whole Dutch game of the World Cup was created around, you get Arjen Norman the ball, and then he, dri he dribbles. And there's some guidance, you know, tell him, you tell him a couple of things, you give him a couple of pointers, but essentially he's making those decisions all the time while he's running, and that's what wins you the game. So I think there, there's two kinds of players, and one needs much more data than the other does. The, the other one on the, on the rugby point, um, obviously now we see so much of the same top-level referees, that different referees have different inter slightly different interpretations. So I think a lot of the, uh, the analysts actually look at that and would set teams up accordingly. Uh, but I think, yeah, it, it depends on obviously how controlled a brand of rugby you're trying to, to play or how controlled a brand of football. Um, it's, it's mixing it up. It's how good you are tactically. It, it could be to the detriment of the, detriment of the game, but at the end of the day, if you're Spain, uh, or sorry, you're Switzerland playing Spain in a World Cup and the only way you have to beat them is by setting your team up ultra defensive and, and jamming, jamming a goal. That's what you have to do. Yeah. And you've done a fantastic job if you pull it off. Yeah, that's what Derry had to do against Dublin at the weekend because yeah. otherwise they get beaten 15 points. Um, this might be the best question of the night from Rory Farrell on Twitter. Can you explain how the football manager scouting system got it so wrong with Freddie Adu? <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, it's funny because, well, there's a whole book of, of uh, what, what Miles would like to describe as, as glitches. Um, but by the time he was put into the game, he'd already got a $10 million contract from Nike as the, the, the best young up-and-coming talent. Uh, and now, obviously, he's gone on a free transfer to the Finnish uh, Premier League. Yeah. So, uh, no, I can't explain that, to be honest. I, I, yeah, it was before <laughs> my time, I think. <laughs> Right, on behalf of everybody at Balls.ie, thanks to everybody for coming out tonight. On behalf of the Science Gallery, a reminder that live blogging at the Science Gallery runs until the 16th of April. Hello to everybody. You've been a wonderful audience at home. You've been an amazing audience here. Please give it up for Simon Cooper and Tom Markham. <laughs> <laughs>